Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, we got something that we're going to talk about. We'll talk about, now I, I want y'all to understand, uh, she's a hoe, okay, this is her name, Babylon the Great, the mother of the prostitutes or the mother of the hoes, according to, no, it's not a derogatory word, it really calls her that in the King James Version. Mother of all the harlots, mother of all the whores of this earth, and of the disgusting things of the earth. That's her name. She's got a big name. We'll talk about her in the future. Let's talk about, because everybody wants to know who the wild beast is and what's the ten horns and, 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 and the number, the 666 info. So let's prove to you guys who the wild beast is without having to go all over the place and try to decipher things and understand the symbolism. We're going to start with the 17th chapter, not the 13th chapter, where we first find out about this beast. We're going to start with the 17th chapter because it's descriptive. We're going to start with verse number... Now, I want you all to pay attention. We're going to start with verse number 8. Most people wouldn't start with verse number 8, but this is where we first really find out any information. The wild beast that you saw was. Okay, so at one point it was there. Then it wasn't there. It appeared not to be anymore. And then yet it ascends out of the abyss, so it shows up again. And it is to go off into destruction. So its end is destruction. So it was there, then it wasn't there, then it shows up again, and then it is destroyed. That, that's all it's saying. So then the inhabitants of the earth, the people, those whose names have not been written in the scroll of life, the people who are not serving God, even though they claim they're serving God, according to this, they're not even in his book. They don't deserve life because they're going to get the same thing the wild beast is going to get, which is destruction. I didn't say it. It says it. It says they're not deserving of life. Their names are not written in the scroll of life. They don't deserve life. From the founding of the world, said they will be amazed when they see how the wild beast was. It was there at one point, then it wasn't, it had disappeared, and then it showed up again. Ha, here I am. Make sense? It's simple, ain't it? It's not complicated to understand when you look at it for what it says. Then it says, ah, here's the most important scripture referring to the wild beast. This calls for a mind that has wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the book of Proverbs, the first chapter and the second chapter and the eighth chapter, wisdom comes from God. First chapter, verse seven. So it says an individual must have a spiritual mind and look at it from God's standpoint. Let, let's click on the mind thing because I ain't never did that before. Literally. Ah, for intelligence, but not human intelligence. Scriptural intelligence. So let's use the scriptures to find out who this is. The seven heads of the wild beast. We find out the wild beast has seven heads. And, and the way we find this out, it says that upon his heads are these diadem type of things. But it has seven heads and ten horns. Okay? There it is right there. Why is it that you are amazed? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the wild beast that is carrying her that has seven heads and ten horns. So, pay attention to what he says again because it's important. Because he's talking about the same beast for which the woman sits on top. Says they are seven kings. Ah, okay, that's simple. Pay attention. Seven kings. They don't mean mountains. The only reason why the reference to mountains is there because kingdoms usually sit on top of mountains. It was a protection thing. Why? Because if enemies attacked, you could see them coming. You didn't want your kingdom, your castle, in the middle of a valley. Less protection that way. So kingdoms usually sat on top of mountains, i.e. seven mountains. So the seven kings, seven kings, or seven kingdoms. That's the mountains thing. 
and it says they are seven kings, so they are kingdoms. Five have fallen. Well, this was written in 96 CE or 96 AD. CE and AD stands for the same thing. CE stands for common error, and AD stands for Anno Domini, or in the year of our Lord. So, in 96 CE, this was written. So it says, by that time that this was written, five have fallen. Hmm. So it ain't talking about the kingdoms of today. It's talking about the kingdoms of the past. So how do we determine what those kingdoms were? Well, I'm going to tell you for the sake of understanding this, it's not important to determine what those kingdoms were. But if you go back through biblical history, look at the major kingdoms that had a conflict with God's people. Because remember, this is the wisdom that needs to be taken in, not the, the seven kingdoms of the world throughout history that was this and that. But the first kingdom you learn about is Egypt. Then the next kingdom you learn about is Assyria. Then the next kingdom you learn about is Babylon. And then the next kingdom you learn about is Medo-Persia. The next kingdom you learn about after Medo-Persia is Greece. And the next kingdom you learn about is, oh snap, that was five. Look at that. Assyria, Egypt, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Egypt. Five. And they're all listed in the Bible as having major conflicts. Oh, wait, hold on. That's not the only place they've written. Hold on, let me show y'all something. Those of y'all who think that this is just being made up, let's go ahead and we're going to go over to my boy D. Y'all know about my boy D, right? Daniel? Yeah, we can go over to Daniel. We can go to Daniel. and Let's go to Daniel. Hey, Daniel, uh, let's talk to your eighth uh, chapter. And, ladies and gentlemen, the 8th chapter is very good at explaining things. Okay? Because that's what Daniel that's what Daniel does. Now, I want y'all to hear what happened. He says, but while he was speaking with me, I fell fast asleep on my face to the ground. And he touched me and made me stand up where I had been standing. And then he said, here, I am causing you to know what will happen in the final part of the denunciation because it is for the appointed time of the end our day okay it is for the appointed time of the end now what had happened is daniel had seen some creatures he had seen a two-horned ram he had seen the hairy male goat and he had seen this other beast so let's find out what's going on he says the two-horned ram stands for the kings of Medo and persia Media and Persia, Medo Persia. This was the Persians, the so called Spartacus. Okay. Then he said the hairy he goat stands for the king of Greece. And the great horn what, that was between his eyes stands for the first king. Now, Alexander the Great, he was called the Great before he had even died. Alexander the Great, ladies and gentlemen was called the great even in scripture before he was even born and it says it stands for the great horn okay he is the first king he wasn't the first king of greece alexander the great succeeded his father of mesopotamia but he was the first king watch as for the horn that was broken so that four stood up instead of it there are four kingdoms from his nation that will stand up but not with his power well when alexander the great died he died without an heir so his four generals divided up his kingdom to four directions north west east south just as it says the four kingdoms don't believe me go back and look at when daniel was written and then look at how many hundreds of years later greece came into power so if you don't think the bible has any truth to it go back and look at this prophecy in daniel the eighth chapter and read it for yourself read it as how it is very descriptive it doesn't leave you for guessing it tells you exactly what stands for what you don't have to guess okay so let's go back to revelation because that's important 
five have fallen. Egypt, Assyria, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Babylon. Those are your five. Now he says one is, well, the kingdom that was around when this was written was Rome. So that's six horns, because we're talking about horns, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about horns. I mean, heads. I'm sorry, we're not talking about horns. We're talking about heads. I apologize. We're talking about seven heads. We're going to talk about the horns later, another video. Just going to talk about the heads. Seven heads, all representing kingdoms. See, seven mountains. The heads, seven heads stand for seven mountains. So we're talking about the heads, not the horns. The heads. Five have fallen, one is. So we named six. And the other has not yet arrived, but when he does arrive, he must remain a short while. The he is not a person. Remember, we're talking about kingdoms here. The he is a nation. So who came after Rome? Now, everybody would be guessing and they'd be wrong. Because remember, this last kingdom, this one, this seventh head, is when everything eventually goes off into destruction. There is no ninth head, tenth head. So let's, okay, let's find out. We found out that there are kingdoms. Okay, it says, but the ten horns. Oh, the ten horns mean something else. That you saw mean ten kings. Ladies and gentlemen. We're still talking about kingdoms here, but I want you to pay attention. It tells us what it means. So why are so many people guessing? It says the 10 horns that you saw mean 10 kings. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the horns stand for the kings. The head stands for the kingdoms. The horns stand for the kings. The heads stand for the kingdoms. And it says these 10 kings, collectively, who have not yet received a kingdom, but they do receive authority as kings for one hour with the wild beasts. Hmm. All of these kingdoms are going to come together and they're going to control everything along with this wild beast. Now, if you don't pay attention, that's called a new world order. Because it has never happened before. Pay attention. It has never happened before. So it is new. And it is a world order because they receive power. It says they have one thought so that they give their power and authority to the wild beasts. Really? And then it says these will battle with the lamb. The 13th chapter tells us this. But because the lamb is Lord of Lord and King of Kings, the lamb will conquer them. And those who are with him who are called and chosen and faithful will do so. Ladies and gentlemen, this wild beast forms a one world government. Why? Because they give all of their authority to the wild beast. I know some of you, don't cry. Don't cry, dry your eyes. Here comes your mother with the cute little guys. Okay, don't cry. It doesn't matter if you don't agree. You see, this is not about agreement. This is not about disagreement. This has nothing to do with neither. It doesn't matter what you believe. Do you understand that? Let's do this so that you understand. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has yet to arrive. But when he does arrive, he must remain for a short while. And the wild beast that you saw but was not, or but is not, it also is an eighth king, but it springs up from the seven and it goes off into destruction. So see, there is no, pay attention, the wild beast itself, when they give all of their authority to the wild beast, it becomes king, it becomes ruler. It is a one world government. Now, it shows up and then goes off into destruction. Go back and look at the 19th chapter of Revelation, that's what it talks about, and the 13th chapter of Revelation, that's what it talks about. Okay? They don't believe me? Go and take a look. But again, stop putting your own meaning into this. Stop trying to figure out that it's seven mountains. 
That's what people, well, it means the mount, seven mountains of Europe. It didn't say nothing like it. It says they are seven kings. It doesn't mean mountains of Europe. It ain't got nothing to do with Europe, people. It ain't said nothing like we ain't read nothing about those seven mountains of Europe. It tells us that those mountains are seven kings. So the mountains mean kingdom. If you don't believe me, go ahead and look at how in the scriptures mountains signify kingdoms. Give me one second. We've got one more thing to talk about. In what sense does mountains signify kingdoms? Question mark. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, as you saw that there was no setting them up and ask him for anything else. Let's just deal with the basic, pay attention, the basic symbolism. Now, I want you to hear, because I didn't tell it. Mountains signifying kingdoms is a complex concept with multiple layers of meaning, depending on the context. Here are some ways mountains can represent or be associated with kingdoms. Symbolically. Power and grandeur. Mountains, with their imposing height and majestic presence, represent strength, stability, and dominance. These qualities naturally align with the image of a powerful kingdom. Boundaries and barriers. Mountains naturally create borders, separating and defining territories. This makes them fitting symbols for the limits of a kingdom's domain. Challenge and conquest. Scaling a mountain is a formidable task, requiring effort and determination. You can see your enemies coming. It made it more difficult for them to attack because they had to climb up the mountain. That means you could shoot down at your enemies as opposed to having to shoot up. You, you guys seen snipers, how they parched themselves higher than their enemy? That's what the whole concept was. Overcoming such challenges can be seen as an allegory for conquering enemies and building an empire. Historically, natural fortresses. Throughout history, mountains have provided strategic advantage. Their height and difficult terrain served as natural defenses against invaders, making them ideal locations for building castles and establishing fortifications. This association with protection and control cemented the link between mountains and kingdoms. Resource wealth. Mountains often hold valuable resources. All right, all right, all right, enough. So, again, it is not complicated. It never was complicated. The only thing... <sighs> People don't want to accept the most basic answer because they need grandiose. It needs to be amazing. What else could be more amazing than more than 2,000 years ago? The Bible predicted that there would be a one world government, that the nations would give all of their power to the wild beasts. If you don't know who the wild beast is by now, they call it the United Nations. Now, if you don't believe me, pay attention. The 10 kings, 10 in the Bible stands for completion. The 10 kings give all of their power to the wild beast for a short time. It says they do not receive authority as kings, or excuse me, but they do receive authority as kings for one hour with the wild beast. Pay attention, people. The nations are going to use the United Nations to control the world. If you don't believe me, go look at the news. Go look at the agendas, especially agenda number 2030. Don't believe me. All you got to do is pay attention. And when they give that power and authority to the wild beasts, these have one thought, and they give their power and authority to the wild beasts, the United Nations. It's right there in front of you. I didn't say this. Okay, hold on. One second, y'all. I got to get back over here. Wake up. I'm told that the United Nations is receiving authority from many nations 
to unify the power and control over certain agendas. Can you explain how this is and when did it start? Question mark. And particularly things like Agenda 21 and the Agenda of 2030? Question mark. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last thing because I got to go. I have a meeting in three minutes and I wasn't supposed to take this long. So uh, I won't be putting this link in uh, because just won't have the time. I'll just be putting this video up. So it'll be one second. He says it needs clarification. The statement about the United Nations receiving authority from many nations to unify power and control over certain agendas is a complex one and needs some clarification, particularly regarding Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030. Well, no, 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 let me, member states retain national sovereignty, but agree, agree to cooperate on certain issues through treaties and agreements. The UN's main bodies, like the General Assembly and Security Council, make decisions through voting. They give their power to the wild beasts. Who? becomes an eighth king. I, I'm not making this up. Go ahead and look at the history. Remember, the United Nations used to be the League of Nations. It was the League of Nations and the League of Nations faded out. So it was, then it wasn't. <laughs> then it showed up again in 1945 as the United Nations. Don't believe me, go look at the history. Don't take my word for it. Go take a look. Go take a look for yourself. All right, hey, gotta go. Have a good day, everybody. It was fun. Bye-bye.